It won't matter who the New Orleans Saints have at quarterback in 2023 if they can't keep them protected. Could Florida offensive lineman Osiris Torrance be the key? We got all of that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, we're free and available on all podcast apps and on YouTube as well. And I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson. Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media, CrescentCitySports.com, USA Today's Saints Wire, Tuesdays in Locked On NFL. And here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked on Saints. And today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. Have you ever dreamed of being an NFL GM and managing your own football franchise? Well, if so, this game is definitely for you. You can download the mobile game for free over at ultimate-gm.com or look it up in your app store. Our listeners are also going to get a 100% free boost to your franchise when you use the promo code Locked On in all caps in the game store on today's episode we've got mock draft monday yeah it's officially back and you know what if you're listening to this or you're watching this on sunday night welcome in you get a little bit early totally fine but it's mock draft monday nonetheless so we'll take a look at whether or not the first round edge rusher trend will continue and if it does what the other trend is that you don't want to see continue we'll look at two mock drafts that uh that kind of match the Saints with two edge rushers and we try to look and see is it going to work out? Because the Saints have had a little bit of trouble with that position here recently. But first, I want to start off with my own four-round mock draft. Yeah, I'm being selfish on today's episode of Locked on Saints. It's carnival season. You see the beads. Well, the 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 chain. You see the, the, the Mardi Gras chain, if you're watching over on the YouTube side. If you're listening, welcome to Locked on Saints ASMR edition. We're rolling. Okay. So I did a four-round mock draft for you because I was trying to keep it tight. Just want to keep it to the first part of today's show and everything. So the idea here is to just take a look at, like, how do we maximize the first four selections for the New Orleans Saints in this mock draft. Try to hit some of those positions of need, uh, but also just take a look at players that would be a good fit for the New Orleans Saints. In last week's kind of mock draft Monday, quote unquote, what we did was that we went round by round and looked at the clouds of quarterbacks where I conveniently left off Stetson Bennett, who I have not circled back around to, but I promise you we will. Um, But this time I wanted to focus more on who are the guys that make sense for the New Orleans Saints. So I played out the scenario here. Remember, these are all scenarios. And what I was able to do was kick off this mock draft with a with, with, with a pick that makes sense for the New Orleans Saints, but would also have positive impact for them. And that was starting us off with Osiris Torrance, the Florida Gators offensive lineman, uh, offensive guard is effectively where you would plug him in. And this is a guy that you're drafting because he's your replacement for Andrus Pete at left guard. Like that's the reason that you're going out and you're grabbing uh, in Osiris Torrance. And Look, there's a lot of stuff to like about Osiris Torrance. Uh, we'll get to some of the sort of like numbers around sacks and things like that here in just a second. But the big thing that you're really looking for here is, can you find somebody that is a wrecking ball, demolition crew kind of offensive lineman that can come in and save you from yourself? Like, that's really what you're looking for. And the reason why I say save you for yourself is because the interest Pete thing, it, it, ain't, it, it hasn't worked out, right? Like, it's not working consistently because the guy can't stay on the field. Best ability is availability, right? And so that's why you like a guy like Osiris Torrance, who has a ton of starts over the course of his career, played over 1,500 snaps in his career with the Florida Gators, including like uh, uh, over what was over 300 all four seasons, uh, over 400 his first season. That was actually at Louisiana Lafayette. So he's also a little bit of a local guy in terms of all that too, which is kind of dope. But he spent that last year over with the Florida Gators. And thankfully he did. You know why? Because he went out there with the Florida Gators and allowed eight total pressures, eight total pressures in the SEC against SEC defensive linemen. (laughs) That's a really good fit, right? That's somebody that's obviously shown you the production. He's shown you what he's able to do. He allowed uh, five total pressures in 2021. That included 
four hurries and one hit. He's allowed uh, two, uh, according to uh, Pro Football Focus, two pressures in 2020. Both of those were hurries, and he allowed 10 pressures his first season at Louisiana Lafayette back in 2019. All 10 of those hurries. One hit credited to him throughout his entire playing career, zero sacks credited to him in his entire playing career. Now, obviously, one place is charting, going to be a little bit different than other places charting, sometimes might be different than the reality of it all too, right? So we'll take that sort of with what it is, though, that there is nothing glaring on tape in which he allowed a sack or allowed his quarterback to even be hit but once in his entire career. So why is he a bottom of the first round guy and not a top of the first round guy? And it all comes down to position. He plays on the interior. Interior offensive linemen don't get drafted highly, not consistently, right? There's a couple here and there that it happens with, but for the most part, those early offensive linemen that get drafted are tackles, right? The guys that are on the outside that are going up against the super athletic edge rushers, all of that, uh, the Iki Iquanus of the world, the Charles Crosses of the world, the Trevor Pinnings of the world, right? Those are the guys that get drafted early in, in the NFL draft. So him being drafted in the first round at all is a sign of how good he is, much like Cesar Ruiz, who we saw really come to life in 2022. And the other key to this is that you're trying to get the offensive line in a place where it's going to be able to produce for you in 2023, but also beyond. So think about this. You've got Ryan Ramchick, who was drafted in 2017. He would be the elder statesman of your offensive line if you're replacing Andrus Pete with Cyrus uh, Osiris Torrance, because then you look at uh, what's directly to the left of uh, uh, Ryan Ramchick, you've got Cesar Ruiz drafted in 2020 at center. You've got Eric McCoy drafted in 20, uh, 2019. You've got, you would have Osiris Torrance drafted in 2022, 2023. And then you have Trevor Penning, who should be the starter at left tackle going into next year, depending on his injury recovery. Remember it was a Liz Frank injury. So the timetable on those are always kind of weird, but he's on the exact same timetable that Taysom Hill was on, but different position, very demanding position on that foot, all of that. So then you would have him who was drafted in 2022. So you would have a very young offensive line to where if in 2023 they get kicking and they can stay healthy, then they can continue to build from there. So Osiris Torrance to me feels like the guy that can have an immediate impact for the New Orleans Saints. That's a safe pick. That's a fit. It's a type of selection that they would make at uh, pick 29. So easy one for me to do there. Uh, the other three picks that I did uh, in the second round at pick 40, I went with Adetomawa Adabare, the, uh, the the edge rusher from Northwestern, and you can move him inside out, has a, a lengthy pass rushing move uh, list, was one of the few standouts in terms of the defensive line and mobile, all of that. I, I really, really like uh, Adetomawa Adabare. I think that he is one of those guys that you draft and then you just throw him out there. And look, he'll rotate with all these other guys, with Cam Jordan, with Carl Granderson, that's what keeps the legs fresh, all that. But I think he would be the one that has another immediate impact for the New Orleans Saints who need a lot of help on the edge. Marcus Davenport might not be back in 2023. The Saints have no idea yet what they have in Peyton Turner because much like Andrew Speed, he can't stay on the field. So you've got to do something at edge and drafting a guy like Adetumo Adabare out of Northwestern would be awesome. Uh, Jalen Hyatt, the wide receiver out of Tennessee, Six foot, six foot one. He's probably going to come in a little bit shorter than that, right? Then he's listed uh, when it comes to the combine, but super good speed, good contested catch guy, does a lot of things well uh, in those areas. So can come in and be kind of your X receiver, but really what you're going to have with a Jalen Hyatt, a Chris Olave and a Rashid Shaheed is three Z's that can play X, right? And so when I say X, what I mean is the X receiver who's usually your wide receiver one. They're on the weak side of the offense. They're by themselves usually. The slot guy is usually lining up on the opposite side. The person that's opposite the X receiver is the Z receiver, your flanker. He's lining up off the line of scrimmage, usually gets the deep route combinations, or the deep deep route, Um, uh, uh, and it's not really combination that I'm looking for, but he, he's the deep, you know, deep threat, all those things. The thing that effectively Chris Olave was drafted to be, you could then allow Chris Olave to be, but then you can mix and match Rashid Shahid, Chris Olave, Jalen Hyatt all over the offense and keep them in the game, which was a curious thing that the New Orleans Saints, for whatever reason, struggled with last year to where they were pulling these guys off the field and then putting other guys on the field in critical game situations. Jalen Hyatt, the other thing that connects him to the New Orleans Saints, Cody Burns, who's the New Orleans Saints uh, wide receiver coach. He was Jalen Hyatt's wide receiver coach last year with Tennessee or the year before last with Tennessee before he made the move up to the NFL. And then finally, Jair Brown. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite prospects in this year's draft, the Penn State safety 
You want a free roaming safety that guy that has great ball skills, good uh, good ball tracking ability. He checks that box. You want somebody that's a willing tackler. He checks that box. Probably need to develop a little bit more in terms of tackling, but pretty much every safety in this year's class either is or or either is a good tackler, but isn't a very good deep coverage guy, or is a deep coverage guy and isn't a very good tackler. Jair Brown, very good cover guy, pretty good tackler has some room to improve. That's a good space to be. So I really, really like what he would bring as well. So that would be uh, Osiris Torrance in the first round. In the second round, uh, Atatomo Adabare out of Northwestern, the edge rusher in the third round, Jalen Hyatt, the wide receiver out of Tennessee. And then in the fourth round, Jair Brown, the safety out of Penn State. Four guys that can come in and have an immediate impact for you. And of course, this is with the assumption that the New Orleans Saints address their starting quarterback needs in free agency, whether it's Derek Carr or otherwise. So that's kind of the scenario that I'm working with. If that wasn't the scenario that I'm working with, then yeah, I probably would have grabbed Hendon Hooker in place of Jalen Hyatt in that third round, maybe grabbed him in the second round, but passing on Autobare is a hard one for me. So, uh, but I definitely would have gotten a quarterback in there had I not been working with that assumption. Now you'll notice that I took an offensive lineman with the New Orleans Saints in this draft. The reason why I did that is because it's a pick that the New Orleans Saints would oftentimes make. Uh, but the other selection and position that they tend to focus on in the first round is edge rusher. And so will that trend continue? And if so, what trend do you want to see not continue as a part of that? We're going to break that down as we continue on uh, with today's episode of Locked on Saints. In today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends over at Ultimate Pro Football GM, literally the most fun mobile game I've ever played. And you can play it anytime, anywhere because of the fact that it's entirely offline and free to play. If you're somebody that loves like franchise modes on your favorite video game, but it doesn't really get in depth enough for you, then this is the game for you because this does get in depth in every conceivable sense. You've got everything from custom rosters and custom teams. So that if you want to be able to cut, you know, the players that you want to see cut, you want to be able to sign the players that you want to see signed. You want to be able to draft the players that you want to see drafted. You're able to do all that. You can uh, make moves on head coaches, coordinators, sports psychologists, team doctors, team scouts, salary cap management, all of that stuff is in here and it is super fun and you can go at your own pace. You can play a season a day. You can do 10 seasons in a day if you want to. It does not matter. There's nothing holding you back when it comes to this game, which is probably my favorite part about it. It's engaging. It's fun. It's super, super easy uh, to get to kind of get the hang of. But then also, nothing's ever going to get in your way while you're playing. It's awesome. So go and check it out today. You can download it by heading over to ultimate-gm.com or you can search Ultimate Pro Football GM in your app store today. And don't forget that our listeners are going to get a 100% free boost when they use the promo code locked on in all caps in the game store. Once again, that's promo code locked on in the game store for that 100% free boost. Ultimate-gm.com or ultimate pro football GM in your app store. Start your dynasty today. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. The New Orleans Saints have uh, some trends, some tendencies in the NFL draft, and uh, particularly when it's tied to the position of edge rusher, there's two prominent tendencies, trends that they have. One of them can work as long as the other one doesn't happen. We got that uh, for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. Appreciate you so much for making this your first listen of the day. So uh, I want to start off first with sort of the trend for the New Orleans Saints, right? They, you, you've seen them invest in the trenches in the first round for years and years and years and years. Even last year, when the draft tendencies changed a little bit, you saw them kind of go outside the prototype. You saw them investing uh, overall uh, 100, you know, top 100 picks um, in premier positions, premium positions, which we hadn't really seen them doing a ton uh, in the recent past, but they still invested in the trenches. You got Trevor Penning in 2022, Peyton Turner in 2021, Cesar Ruiz in 2020, uh, Eric McCoy was the top selection in 2019, even though he was a second round pick. Marcus Davenport in 2018. Uh, Ryan Ramchek, along with Marshawn Lattimore in 2017. Then you've got Sheldon Rankins. You've got Andrus Pete. So that goes all the way back to then 2015, right? To where there was at least one player from the offensive or defensive line selected. But there's a specific secondary trend when it comes to the edge rushers that the New Orleans Saints have drafted in recent years. 2018, Marcus Davenport. 2021, Peyton Turner. Neither of those guys so far have panned out. Now, Marcus Emport had a really nice season in 2021, but he followed it up in 2022 in a season where he had more ejections than sacks. He was ejected in the final game against the Carolina Panthers, and he finished the game, finished the season with a half 
sack on that ejection. So one whole ejection, one half of a sack. That's not great in a contract season. Peyton Turner can't stay on the field. And that's that's not something that I'm going to look at him and say, oh, well, he's injury prone or all these other things. It all speaks for itself, right? If you can't be on the field, it's going to be hard to stay on the field. And there were also times where he was a healthy scratch. He was inactive toward the end of the season, which tells you a lot of either was he in shape, brings in a whole lot of questions. Jeff Ireland specifically during the Senior Bowl saying that they still very much see Peyton Turner as an edge rusher, as a defensive end, but he's got to come back in 2023. And he said two things, show that he can stay healthy and show up in shape. And so that raises a lot of questions in terms of where Peyton Turner's development has been. I am somebody who has always had a lot of hope for Peyton Turner because the guy has all of the tools, but so far he hasn't been able to be out there and he hasn't been able to put it on display. And when he has been out there, he's actually been pretty impactful. Like we've seen him have impactful games, just not on a consistent basis. We've seen flashes. And that's the way that Peyton Turner described his training camp to me when I asked him about how was your training camp? And he, you know, and he mentioned flashy. It was flashy, but I need to work on being more consistent. So he's aware, you know, none of this is like out of Peyton Turner's head to where he's like ob- oblivious to where he needs to improve. He knows very well where he needs to improve. And so let's wait and see if he does it. But as of right now, it's safe to say that this, the trend for the Saints is that they tend to miss when it comes to edge rushers that they select here in the first round. Now, we've we've got two, right? We've got two in the past 15 or so seasons. And so, you know, considering that and keeping that in mind, it is a small sample size. Uh, sorry, uh, two in the past, what would this be? 12 seasons. So uh, Cam Jordan was the last one before Marcus Davenport drafted in the first round. That was back in 2011. So it is a small sample size, but to have those two misses within three years or what we suspect will be two misses, right, within three years, I think we have to let Peyton Turner play things out a little bit still. But Marcus Davenport might not be back in the building in 2021 or 2023. They they went and got an undrafted free agent in, in, in Carl Granderson a couple of years ago, and he might get a second contract with the New Orleans Saints while Marcus Davenport, the first round pick that they traded a future first round pick to get, right? They invested two first round picks in him. Uh, he might not get a second contract. That's just kind of wild. And that's not the situation that you want to be in. So that brings me to uh, a couple of selections that were made by folks that are picking around the New Orleans Saints in terms of their mock drafts. I want to start off with our friends over at Locked On NFL Draft. That is uh, Keith Sanchez and Damian Parson. This is Keith Sanchez's mock draft from over at the Draft Network. So the mock selection that he made for the New Orleans Saints was edge rusher Derek Hall out of Auburn. Now, a couple of things to know about Derek Hall. Uh, Derek Hall has mostly been seen as an outside linebacker type of pass rusher, a stand up two point stance, odd front kind of guy. Uh, six foot three, 251 pounds, though, unless he picks up some some weight there, probably starting off you know, high in your leverage isn't going to be great for Derek Carr. Derek Hall. Oh, that's going to be tough. If if Derek Carr and Derek Hall ended up on the same team, that would take me all the way back to the um, potential Cameron Jordan, Jordan Cameron year that we almost had. But so when it comes down to Derek Hall, you're having to kind of teach him, you would have to transition him a little bit into being a hand in the dirt edge rusher here in the New Orleans system. Yeah, uh, the Saints brought in Joe Woods. Yeah, the Saints brought in Todd Grantham, who's going to be the you know defensive line coach. Joe Woods, of course, the defensive coordinator. But this is still Dennis Allen's system. We all understand that. And so you're still asking pretty much the same thing. Like we know what the New Orleans Saints defense is going to look like in 2023 in terms of scheme, in terms of how they play. And they don't do a lot of stand up rushing. They do some but it's a mix in change of pace thing on like rushing downs. It's not oftentimes, or, or excuse me, passing downs. It's not oftentimes in every down go to. More times than not in New Orleans, an edge rusher's hand is in the dirt. It's a three point stance. And so you'd have to get Derek Hall there. And Derek Hall is one of those players that some people will say is a developing pass rusher, but other people will hear the subtext of that, which is underdeveloped pass rusher. <clears throat> We've been down this road before. And so these, this, this is one of those picks to where I hear it and I think, yeah, I, I like Derek Hall. I know what he can do, but is the system too much of a shift in New Orleans away from what he did really, really well in, um, in Auburn? The thing that is unique about Derek Hall, though, is that he is a phenomenal run defender, a really, really, he's phenomenal at setting the edge, very smart, understands blocking leverage, has a lot of experience. Uh, as a starter, has played a ton of snaps, and he's done 
a lot of good things. So just over the course of his career, nearly 2,000 total snaps played, 933 of those, according to Pro Football Focus, being pass rushing snaps. Now, in terms of sack production and things like that, you're looking at uh, 2021, where he had 10 sacks, 2022, where he had eight sacks. And that's the way that Pro Football Focus looks at it. If you look at like sports reference, for instance, what you're going to see instead is uh, six and a half sacks in 2022 and then nine sacks in 2021. That just means that there's some half sacks in there that Pro Football Focus credits as whole. Other venues credit it as a half sack. So so you have all of that, but you've also got 11 and a half tackles for a loss last year, along with 12 and a half from 2021. So he's been consistently productive as a pass rusher, as well as as a run defender in the SEC for the past two years. So that's a good pedigree. That's a good catalog resume to bring with you into the league for sure. But is the transition of moving him into putting his hand in the dirt, trying to help him develop more pass rushing skills, not having a lot of length, about six foot three. So he's a little bit shorter than the New Orleans Saints usual prototype, 250 pounds or so, a little bit lighter than the New Orleans Saints usual prototype. But how does that prototype change with Ryan Nielsen out, Todd Grantham in, and perhaps Dennis Allen, even though it's still his system, being a little bit more flexible about trying to get speed rushers in, because that would certainly help them against mobile quarterbacks. That's another place where a guy like Derek Hall ends up having a massive impact for you though. So if the Saints were to go this route, they would follow the trend of investing in the trenches in the first round, but they would need to buck the trend of edge rushers not panning out for them when they're invested in to, or, or, or edge rushers that they've invested in early, not panning out for them. We've got another mock draft pick that we'll take a look at from our own Peacock and Williamson show, former NFL scout Matt Williamson mocked Lucas Van Ness from uh, Iowa to the New Orleans Saints. And I don't think that's a great fit either, but I have a very, very good reason as to why. And I'll tell you immediately here in just a moment as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Wrap it up today's episode of Locked on Saints with a look at Iowa defensive end Lucas Van Ness. Um, and I told you I was going to tell you immediately why I don't think that this would be a good pick for the Saints. Let me tell you the wildest thing you're going to hear about a potential first round prospect in this year's draft, assuming we don't get any bong mask videos. Um, Lucas Van Ness has never started a game. Never started a game in his collegiate career. He's played a lot. Okay. I don't want to take everything away from him. Uh, played just two seasons, 940 total snaps, over 400 each season, pass rushing snaps of 271 in 2022, according to PFF, 287 back in 221. So he still played a lot of snaps and he's had some production as well. Six uh, sacks in 2022 seven sacks in 2021. He's also been a bit of a pest in the run game, 10 and a half tackles for a loss last year, eight and a half the year before that. Mm, that's that, That's okay. Um, but this guy has never started a game. And so you wonder if the inexperience of Lucas Van Ness ends up having a massive impact on his draft stock, or if he's still actually going to be a potential first round pick. Now I'll tell you this right now, Iowa graduate Mike Triplett would be out of his mind excited. I know it about Lucas Van Ness being a New Orleans Saint and rightfully so as well. He should over at New Orleans dot football. Shout out those guys. But I don't know about a first round pick, maybe second, maybe second. If he falls a little bit, maybe trade up for him in the second. If you're, you know, if, if you make your pick at 40, don't want to wait around until 71, trade up and go and grab him. I'm all for that. All for that. But a, a first round guy that's never started a game, I get a little bit worried about the inexperience. But to argue against myself for a moment, maybe it's not the inexperience that I should be focusing on. And it's the wear and tear, right? Because what's one of the other things that has gone wrong for the New Orleans Saints when it comes to edge, edge rushers over the course of the past couple of years when they've selected them in the draft? Injuries. Marcus Davenport had trouble staying on the field. Peyton Turner has had trouble staying on the field. So maybe getting a guy that's six foot, what, five, six, five, six, five, 260 plus pounds. So kind of right where Carl Granderson was coming into the NFL as an undrafted free agent, but without a ton of wear and tear, a ton of bumps and bruises, a ton of, you know, uh, all of that, maybe that actually is a good thing. But in the first round, I'm a little bit nervous, a little bit nervous about that. Um, 
So this was the selection that was made by Matt Williamson over with the uh, our Peacock and Williamson uh, NFL show, which you can go and check out uh, on YouTube or wherever you get your get your podcast. But the reason why I'll just tell you the little blurb that comes with it. So after uh, getting this pick from Denver and the Sean Payton trade, the Saints could go a lot of different directions at 29. Van Ness fits New Orleans defensive scheme as a power end, which is true. Uh, and could eventually be Cam Jordan's successor, which is a big time, perhaps, big time, maybe, big time, pro- I don't even want to say probably when it comes to that. Like, hard for you to really say a guy that's never started a game in his collegiate career is going to be the successor to Cam Jordan. Uh, but there are a lot of things to like about him. He is fine in terms of putting his hand in the ground uh, versus what we were just talking about with Derek Hall. He's a little bit more of a stand up rusher. So he's absolutely got all that. Um, Played, uh, has been playing football since I think it's like the eighth grade. So he's a little bit new, but then he didn't start as a, uh, a as an edge rusher. He started as an interior offensive lineman, then moved to the edge in 2022 primarily. So that's a big thing too. You're talking about a guy that's still learning the position of edge. Are you seeing the red flags here? So then, you know, there's that part, but I promised I would say that I promise I would say the good things. So what are the things that make him fit? Functionally, really strong. Uh, has a lot of strength that comes from playing in the interior, but he has the athleticism to play on the edge. That's a good blend of things. He's a speed to power conversion guy. So it fits the mold of what the New Orleans Saints needed from Marcus Davenport, what they asked for from Peyton Turner. Is that still the way that they go? But there are still things that he's got to figure out. Recognition in terms of what he's seeing from the opposite side. Tony Dungy, when he came into, you know, when he when he had all the massive success that he had early on in his collegiate coaching career, I read everything Tony Dungy writes. Uh, one of the things, well, not everything, but anyway, one of the things, <laughs> one of the things that he wrote in, in, you know, that, that was talked about in his books was like habit building, pattern recognition, things like that. He had a small playbook and he basically just wanted his players to be good at recognizing patterns and building habits off of what they recognize. Kind of like the, uh, Josh Heupel system in Tennessee, what it did for the wide receivers. If this is the leverage of the why of the cornerback then you do this if this is the leverage of the cornerback then you do this that's kind of the way that Tony Dungy taught so that's what you would want to see a little bit of from uh Lucas Van Ness is can you build the habits in terms of your recognition understanding leverage understanding if you're getting if you need to use a half man technique or if you need to do you know an armbar technique when to use your moves how to string things together all of that. So he's got a very, very strong sort of platform in terms of who he is as a pass rusher, but does have things that he needs to do to be able to, con- to to build when he's got really good length. But when that length doesn't win, what does he do next to keep getting after the passer? That's going to be the big thing for you to see. So I think that he has all the tools, but are you going to be able to bring those tools to work in New Orleans, in this system with these? Uh, coaches. Now, it's a different defensive line coach now with Todd Grantham. I wouldn't be surprised to see Todd Grantham pushing them into maybe a little bit more of the Brenton Cox mold who he just coached at Florida, who's a little bit more of a speed rusher, all that, maybe a little bit more of the Derek Hall, maybe a little bit more of the Kalaja Kansi on the interior, those types of guys. But if the Saints do stick with their speed to power conversion, Lucas Van Ness, absolutely a name that you should be aware of because he checks a lot of boxes, including potentially being a little bit underprepared coming into the NFL, and the Saints tend to like those kinds of projects we've seen over the course of the the recent past. We'll see how much that has changed, though, with Dennis Allen at the helm, especially after a strong draft in 2022. All right, coming up in tomorrow's episode, we're taking a look at contracts. That's what we're going to be doing throughout the offseason. We're going to call it Contract Tuesday, to where we're going to build contracts for outgoing New Orleans Saints free agents or incoming New Orleans Saints free agents and sort of pitch around some ideas on how to potentially structure some of those deals. So we're going to start back in the trenches here with Marcus Davenport and David Onyemata. What would a contract look like, to, contract extension look like to keep both of them in New Orleans? And what should it look like? We'll answer those questions in tomorrow's episode. Don't be shy. Send me your recommendations for what those contracts should or shouldn't look like as well. We'll get those uh, folded in to the show. As always, I appreciate you so much for being Locked on Saints, your first listen of the day. For your second listen, make sure you go and check out Locked on NFL Draft and the Peacock and Williamson NFL show available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube as well. Thank you as always for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, a part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi, especially 
out as we're all celebrating Mardi Gras and having a good time celebrating carnival season. Big shout out to Lick. It's great to meet you uh, Saturday at Endymion. Thank you for your kindness as well. Appreciate y'all uh, endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. And as always, if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints, in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.